It's timely. It's insightful. It's motivating. It's empowering. It's time with Fred, your inspirational broadcast with host Fred Gaddy. To free yourself from the past, you must break the rules of silence and compliance. Claudia Black. Hello and thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Time with Fred podcast. This is a podcast that challenges paradigms and mindsets that hold us back. This podcast can be heard on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Amazon, Spotify, and anywhere else you listen to your podcasts. With me today is a special guest who has a very, very powerful story that I guarantee you uh, will, will change your life. She's Sharon Hughes who joins us from California. Sharon is a certified life coach or speaker and host of Living a Limited Life podcast. Sharon is the author of Girl in the Garage, which we're going to be hearing a lot about today. She's a mother of three from Southern California, and I'm honored to share her story here on this podcast. Sharon, thanks for joining in. Oh, Fred, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute honor. The pleasure is all mine. Sharon, oftentimes when I introduce guests, uh, my special guests. There's always the accomplishments and the great things that they've, that they've done, which is which is all great. But there's always a story behind all those. There's always I call it the scars, right behind the stars, if you will. And and you're no exception. Um, in spite of all that you're doing to impact lives positively, you have a powerful story um, that you capture in your book, Girl in the Garage. So. Looking forward to dive in a little bit on this 54th episode of the Time with Fred podcast and, and learning the inspirations and what brought you where you are today. So who is the girl in the garage here? Oh, gosh, Fred, you're just going straight to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm the girl in the garage. It's, you know, it's, it's an interesting story. A lot of things in my life that led up to the incident in the garage and and I'll let you guide me how deep you want to go here today. But, you know, I do say in my book, the girl in the garage is who I thought I was, but I never really was because I talk a lot about belief patterns, what we believe about ourselves. Is it true? Is it not true? You know, where did these ideas come from? And for years I thought, I was the girl in the garage because I was drugged at a Halloween party and I woke up in a garage seven hours later at a different location. And that was bad enough, but it was what happened after that was not having support, not having anywhere to go with my story. You know, and I was young, I was 16. So it set this mindset in motion that that's who I was which was a myth. It was a lie. And for 40 years, I carried that around. So I'm a little bit older than you, Fred, but it was a long journey to get here to discover who I really am. And if what I was believing about myself was even true. Hmm. And, and I like how you, you put it, um, Sean, because for, for a lot of people, we go through life allowing life situations to, to define us or to define who we are. I shared this in a previous edition of the podcast. I was listening to the story about a man who had been laid off and didn't have a job and was being interviewed. And his answer was, you know, he, he thought life wasn't worth living anymore because his job that he had was who he was and everything he lived and breathed was, was his job. And so losing his job, was 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 it i mean he, he didn't have anything else to live for and it was such a sad narrative if you will um for him because he allowed what he did to, to define him and i like how you put it that you know the, the the girl in the garage for a long time had sort of defined you but at what point did you come to the realization that that wasn't going to define you the incident that happened when you were 16 and and with all the painful memories and all of that wouldn't define you and you chose a different path. At what time did that register for you? Gosh, this is like, this is the perfect question right here. It was probably about five, six years ago. I was laying in bed one morning and I was praying and I was saying, I am not going to make it. A lot of things had happened, you know, in between being 16 and to where I was a few years ago. 
And it was just a, a moment of probably extreme brokenness. Even though my faith had always been a guiding principle in my life, I felt completely alone. And I heard God say, what are you believing about yourself? And I thought, really? Like, you know, you know what I believe. It's so bad. It's, you know, and I, and the list was going off in my head. And then I heard him say, is it true? That was pivotal. That completely turned the page in my life. And what was so interesting was that right, right after that, I was working in, in the corporate training world and I was given free creative reign to create anything that I wanted. So I thought, well, these people that I'm working with at this company of 500, you know, they're asking for personal development. So we're going to do this. So in that training, I said, what's the thing that you've been dragging around your whole life? What's that thing that you're believing about yourself? I said, don't, don't tell me. You know, just hold that thought. It could be the coach that said you won't make the cut. It could be the person that walked out on you and said, you know, I, I hate you. You're unlovable. Whatever it is, everybody seems to have a thing. So I did the whole training and I got to the end of that training and I said, okay, now that thing that you've been dragging around with you, what if you let go of it? Who would you be? And there was a girl in, in the front row, I'll never forget, she just blurted out, free. And I thought, we're on to something here. Mm. This whole concept of what do you believe about yourself and is it true? We're on to something here. So I did the same training a couple weeks later for another group. And two people in the room started to cry. Mm. My first thought was, is I'm going to get fired. You can't make people cry in corporate training. <laughs> But what was so interesting was um, one of the people that was crying was a gentleman that was in his mid thirties. And he came up to me after the training and he said, I haven't spoken to my family in 10 years and I'm going to call them tonight. Wow. And I thought, wow, this is deep. This is deep. And that question became the foundation of my book, the foundation of all the coaching work that I do. And just that, that deep message of you're probably not believing the truth about who you are. Wow. And Sharon, that, that's why we, we do what we do, right? As, as podcasters mm -hmm. and life coaches and, and teachers and, and speakers, and that's why we do what we do, because it's, it's the lives that we yeah. impact, right? Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Uh, you, Sharon, you, you, you speak about your, your faith uh, boldly in, in, in your book and in your interviews, and, and I can totally relate um, as, a, as, a, as a person of faith. But how, how do we reconcile um, the fact that God loves us, right? Let, let, me, let me make it personal here. How, how did you rec reconcile the fact that God loves you or loved you through it all, but yet allowed what happened to you to happen to you? Did, did, did that... Did that mess things up for you? Because I ask this question because you hear a lot of people who ask the question, right? If, if God loved us so much in John 3, 16, right? Why, why does he allow all these evil things happening in and around us to happen, right? Um, how were you able to reconcile that with your faith and your personal uh, tragedy that, that, that you went through? I'm so glad you asked that. I actually do have a chapter dedicated to this in my book. Basically, here it is. And for everybody listening that might be angry with God, this is really for you. Every single person on the planet has been given their superpower, which is free will, free choice. Now, whatever you choose to do has consequences, good or bad. So the people that did things to me that were horrible, they used their free will, their power to choose what to do. There was the consequence. There's even a ripple effect, if you will. You know, the, I paid a consequence for somebody else's bad choice, but it rippled out into how I show up in the world, how I interact with people. They felt the ripple effect. You know, a really good example of this is, uh, for, for example, somebody that's driving drunk, they make a really, really bad choice and they get in an accident and they say they kill a family. You know, we can be angry at God. Why did you allow this to happen? 
God created us with that free will because we're not robots. So if you want to be able to choose what you're going to do with your life, you're choosing that there's a consequence. Mm -hmm. And I know this sounds like oversimplified and silly, but if you're going to choose the clothes you're going to wear, what you're going to eat for lunch, the type of car you're going to drive, what TV shows you're going to watch, you're also free to choose those really big things like, do I drive intoxicated? Do I call a cab? Mm -hmm. You know, who's, who's going to pay the price for my mistakes mm -hmm. or my poor choices? So I, I hope that that helps people that think, you know, well, why would God allow this? It's like, well, because you're not a robot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all choices. Mm -hmm. It's all choices. So I was never angry with God and it never affected my faith. I get asked that a lot. A lot of people say, you know, how, how could you believe in God when this happened? And it's like, well, it's not God's fault. Mm -hmm. It's the person that did this to me. It's their yeah. fault. That was yeah. their choice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you tell your story or when you, when you speak about it, you, you don't speak about this from a negative, you, you, you don't come at it from, from a negative uh, standpoint, right? You, you dwell on the lessons and, and how this changed your life and, and how you use this to change other people. And, and, and this is, this is really what this podcast is all about, um, Sharon. It's, it's, it's really just to um, help challenge those, those paradigms, right? Whether they're the narratives we, we believe about ourselves, those, those faulty beliefs or, or whatever people tell us, whether they're mistakes and, and we allow these these things to to keep us stuck, if you will. Um, wh why don't you? Oh, oh, oh why, why did you choose to focus on the lessons, right, and not "woe me, here I am, look at all that happened," you know, all that? Why didn't you dwell on the past, if you will? And and if there's any, if there's a title I want to give to this podcast, is really how to break up. Um, with your past and move forward. I think this is a, a, something that you said in one of your previous po podcasts, and I think this is so powerful. Why, why did you choose not to remain in the past, but rather move forward and use the lessons to, to teach other people that they could do better? Mm. Gosh, you know, it was such a long, long journey because from probably the age of four or five years old, there was different traumas to overcome. I really didn't know anything different than this is what happens and you keep moving forward. Mm. So I can't say that there was some pivotal moment aside from what I just shared of, you know, that God moment of saying, I'm not going to make it. Mm -hmm. I was always really good at putting on this, this mask of I'm fine being, you know, kind of people would call me Susie sunshine. That was how I survived. A lot of people wear different masks, you know, some like men, for example, they might wear the athletic mask. They find their identity in sports and that career. That's how they survive the hard things that happen in their life. So that was a mask that I wore. And honestly, I think it was just truly the grace of God. He knew that I would come to this point and that I would be so healed and so removed from it that I would be able to do this type of work. Mm. And you talk about the mask, um, Sharon, which you're absolutely right, right? We're hiding behind the facade and, you know, we, we don't, we suppress our emotions and all the experiences that we go through. And especially for people who experience abuse specifically, uh, they, there is this, um, stigma right attached to whatever they went through that it becomes so difficult for them to to share their story um or, or give voice to their experience and so that they live behind this mask if you will or suppress it but then pass it on to to, to the children who are probably you know watching them or, or maybe looking up to them and how does one find that boldness, if you will, um, to come out and say, hey, this is what happened to me. Um, albeit knowing who we talked to, because I've always believed that we got to be very careful who we let into our inner circle, right? As mm -hmm. people who are supportive of us, who would guide us in the right direction, not just anyone or throw your story out there on social media for anyone to comment and, and like or whatever, but 
how does one find that confidence and courage to say, I'm not going to be quiet anymore. I'm, I'm going to come out and, and share my story um, or, 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 or speak on it and, and allow this to, to transform the life of someone else who may be dealing with something similar mm. like you did. Mm. Well, I, I think that I'm probably not the norm. I was actually told by a therapist, you're not normal. Most people that have been through the things that you have, have addiction, 10 kids from five baby daddies, and they're mm -hmm. living in a trailer. And when he said that, I was a little bit intrigued, but then I was a little bit like, I think there was a part of me that was kind of bad because I thought, why is that the stereotype? I was different. I always wanted the picket fence and baking cookies and the kids and the dog in the yard and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I can't really tell you how a person can do that un unless it's just framed that they need to do a lot of inner healing mm -hmm. so that they are prepared to tell the story. There's a, a difference. Like you pointed out, I, I don't come up from a negative, like even in my book, I'm very PG. You don't want to throw up on people. You don't want to share details mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that would cause somebody else to be triggered and mm -hmm. for them to digress in their journey. Mm -hmm. So you, it, it's almost like a, a, it's a healing, but it's also a discipline. It's, um, gosh, it, it's finding, like you said, safe places to share that story even though you have maybe a, a circle of friends that you feel like you could tell that to, you still might want to be a little bit careful because mm -hmm. not everybody, and this is no bearing on the person telling the story, but not everybody is prepared to receive that type of story. Because I've had people that have known me for years read my book and they say, I n had no idea. I never knew. And I was like, well, of course you didn't. I didn't, I didn't let that come out. Because the last thing anybody that's been through difficult things, trauma, wants is to walk in a room and feel like it says, you know, trauma victim on their forehead. We don't want to be treated like we're different. I didn't want to be treated like I was, you know, like, oh, poor you. Even now when people say to me, they'll say, oh, I'm so sorry what, what you went through. And I was like, well, that made me who I am, even though it was hard even though there was really, really messy, broken places, it made me who I am. And I feel like um, an overcomer. So the same therapist that told me that I, I was not normal said um, that, well, you should feel like a victim. We were talking about victimhood one day and I was like, why? I'm still standing. Mm -hmm. I'm not laying in the garage. I don't want to be a victim. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like this happened. Okay. Now what? Mm -hmm. Now, what are we going to do about it? And I've also seen this and I've interviewed um, Sharon people who um, have been through abuse, whether they were abused at a young age. And then I had a lady, actually uh, one of my guests who actually was abused at age five, again, raped at five and, and, and 17. And then like it happened three times. And, ended up marrying someone who, who, who was um, emotionally abusive. And I've heard it said that there is that tendency for women in particular to att attract, right, whether emotionally abusive people because of what they've been through, or what, what they experienced um, in that in their childhood. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? Have you, have you seen this or, or heard this based on your experience at all? Oh yeah. That's super, super, super normal. Like that's textbook right there. And it's not, it's not like the woman that has survived a trauma goes out looking intentionally. Let's mm -hmm, find somebody mm -hmm. else to abuse right, me. Right. It's something that's really taking place on the subconscious level mm -hmm. of needing so desperately to be loved. And it just seems like those shady characters will show up and love you just enough to hook you. <sighs> Boy, that's another area where there needs to be deep work. There needs to be healing. You need to come to that place of self-worth. You know, what do you want for yourself? And you being so solid in you and who you are that you're able to have boundaries and spot these people mm -hmm. that have dysfunction. 
it's been really interesting to learn how to do that and to learn how to read people. And, you know, and I have to say this is a lot of people that have been abused, they have been silenced, not just meaning the voice like you're hearing me say now, but their inner voice. A lot of times you'll hear that inner voice. Like some people say, you know, trust your gut. I personally believe that's the Holy Spirit whispering to you. Mm -hmm but we ignore that inner voice so much and silence it that we stop listening completely mm -hmm. and we stop trusting ourselves. So I grew up with people around me that constantly told me, you know, Oh, you're wrong. And they were silencing me in that manner. And I would hear my inner voice saying, no, this isn't right. But as a child, there's nowhere to go. And as a child, you think that the adults around you know more because they're adults, right? And they're supposed to be our protectors and nurture us and help us grow mm -hmm. and navigate the world. And when that is not happening and you stop trusting that inner voice, it's like you turn off your, your radar and you end up being amongst thieves, if you will, that just want to rob from you. That's the very long answer. <laughs> and, it, and it's still a good one. And, and I like it. And I like it. Another thing, uh, Sharon, that you seem to have found through all of this is, is hope. Mm -hmm. Why is hope important um, in the midst of tragedy? Mm. Or why was it important for you? You know, I think I just always believed that there had to be something better. That this this present moment that I was in at different present moments throughout my life, I just somehow knew there's got to be more. This is not it. This is not what we were created for. Without hope, I don't think the soul can survive. Mm -hmm. I, I think our, our spirit and our soul will just be crushed if we give up hope. Mm. Couldn't agree with you more there. So you didn't allow what you went through um, to define you. And one of the questions that I ask Sharon to a lot of my, my guests is, is what defines them. And I ask this question because, again, many of us allow the situations or the labels and all of that to, to define who we are, whether it's, again, mm -hmm. the past mistakes or the experiences or the abuse or failures or, or whatever, to define who we are, that it's almost difficult to extricate ourselves from that it follows us and it, and it becomes our narrative it becomes itself it becomes self-fulfilling pro prophecies for a lot of people mm -hmm. unfortunately so if i were to ask you uh, what defines you sharon what would that be mm. well of course my faith is always first mm. but just really it, it, this is a great exercise for anyone to do is to think about you know what are your core values what are those principles that you stand for? So for me, honesty, integrity, faith, you know, grace, mercy, th those are my, my main core values. If we stick with what we really value, we're not going to end up like the frog in the pot being mm. cooked, mm. trying to jump out at the last minute. Mm. Those values should truly be those guiding principles, our North Star, if you will, that keeps us on the path we're supposed to be on. Mm -hmm. So every decision that you make, every, especially every big life altering decision should be made to line up with your core values and what you truly stand for. And that is a, a huge process. I was, gosh, mid forties, I would say, before I started understanding personal development type mm -hmm. of uh, material and, and diving into that I think I was, gosh, I always have to look back. It was 2013 when I got certified as a life coach. And it was right before that I had read a book by Holly Girth called You're Already Amazing. And that was the first faith-based personal development book I had ever read. And I thought, okay, I grew up in church. Why have I never heard that God thinks I'm, I'm amazing, uh -huh. that I'm wonderful, that he created me this way. Uh -huh. All the churches I had been to was kind of more like, hey, you're really jacked up and you better uh -huh. straighten up or you're uh -huh. going to get zapped by lightning. Uh -huh. I don't think that's who God is. 
I think what the Bible says that you are created in his image pretty much says so much like, like that's just it. Mm -hmm. And then if we even unpack that further, it's like, well, if you're made in God's image, then you're not meant to just play small. Mm -hmm. Like why, why would God make you in his image if you weren't meant for good things? Mm -hmm. If you were just meant to suffer and struggle? Yeah. Oh, we could go deep on that. Yeah. 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 I, I bet. Speak, speaking of going deep, Sharon, there, there's probably someone watching or listening to us who not maybe not may have, might not have experienced you know what you experienced, but maybe has 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 a child or has a daughter. I have a a teenage daughter who's of course growing up, and and I have friends who have daughters who who listen to this podcast who would love, I'm sure would love their their daughters to to, to listen to this. And from your perspective, if you were to speak to that teenage daughter um, or, or, or that mother or, or father who um, would love for their daughters to, to, to glean something uh, from, from this or from your experience. Um, what would you say to them? Mm. Uh, listen to the inner voice and vet your inner voice because you don't want to be living in self-deception, but you need to make sure that you're really living in the truth about who you are and be really, really careful um, moving forward, just the steps that you take, stay true to yourself, find your, find your people, the people that love you and embrace you that don't just tolerate you. And that's, that's not easy, but it's, but it's doable and you will get so far so much faster if you just do those things. Mm. Yeah. And if someone you know, has already experienced this um, and maybe going through that self-loathing process, hating themselves. And this is where, you know, I think I was reading something um, or, or heard it in the news that uh, teenage suicide um, has, has gone up so much, uh, partly due to the pandemic and people being mm -hmm. depressed and all of that. And um, whatever it is that drives teenagers to, to that situation, maybe someone's regretting some mistake they, they made it may, and maybe thinking their the lives are not worth it. Um, how do they still find that grace to move on the strength to move on in spite of what may have happened to them or whatever mistakes they may have made that have brought them to that predicament. Mm. So if that's you listening while you're sitting here in the middle of that terrible pain, and it feels overwhelming and like you're not going to survive. I promise you, you will get through this if you don't give up hope. If you keep believing that tomorrow is a better day and you literally need to take this day by day. And in some cases, you might need to take it moment by moment. But here's what I want you to know. Believing a lie is just as powerful as believing the truth. Mm. You need to be sure that you are standing in the truth of who you are. You need to, you know, lean in, look deep, believe in yourself, reach out and get help. Don't stay quiet. There are people out there that, that want to help and that will embrace you. You need to find your people, even though it's hard, don't give up. Give yourself the time and the space to heal. Be curious about yourself. I'm a lot older than you guys. There used to be a show on TV called Columbo, and he was kind of like the funny uh, PI guy that would solve things, um, solve mysteries and things. Be the Columbo of your life or, or the mad scientist trying to figure out how does this work? Who am I? Where am I going? What am I doing? Give yourself that time, space, but most of all, give yourself grace. Learn to love yourself. Love your freckles. Love your crooked nose. Love your odd laugh and your funny quirks. You are unique. And what you have to offer to this world cannot be done by anybody the way that you can do it. So step into that superpower of choice. Wield your sword and keep going. You're a warrior. You just don't know it yet. And finally, Sharon, where can uh, listeners find your book, Girl in the Garage? 
It's on Amazon.com and of course, BarnesandNoble.com. But if you go to Amazon, there's other like small bookstores that have it as well. And you can always also find me at SharonHughes.net. I think there's links on there also. Yeah. Believing a lie is just as powerful as believing the truth. Sharon, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and for sharing your powerful story, but then also the nuggets and how we can all be more and do more in spite of where we are and not allowing the mistakes and the hurts and everything else, negative things that's happened to us to define who you are. Thank you again for inspiring the world with your story. And to you, our listeners, thank you for tuning in. And um, if you've not checked out um, Sharon's website, I encourage you to do so. Lots of resources and check out that book as well. And um, we'll also be grateful if you can leave us a positive review on our iTunes page. That also helps keeps the show going on. So until next time, thanks again for tuning in and stay well.